How you doing, Spare Parts Army? I'm your regular old infantryman, Chris Cappy, and today we're talking about the South Korean Army's primary assault rifle, the K-2. If you've ever seen a bunch of news footage of South Korean soldiers guarding the border between South and North Korea, you probably thought, hmm, what are those fancy pants rifles they're carrying? Looks really nice. You holding out on us, South Korea? I promise you this much, you're gonna wanna defect to South Korea once you see what they can do. The Daewoo K2 is the standard issue rifle for the ROK Army, or otherwise known as the Republic of Korea Army. The K in the name K2 for the rifle is actually the Korean military designation letter, like M is used in the American military or how the British use the letter L. And the 2 in K2 means what the weapon is. So for example, K1 is a submachine gun or small rifle, K3 is a squad automatic weapon, and so on all the way up to the K14 sniper rifle. The South Koreans spawned a whole industry to make these rifles work. Without realizing it, you've probably seen the K2 on tons of news footage. But it's not just used in South Korea. Armies all over the world in Nigeria, Peru, Lebanon, Cambodia, just to name a few, use this weapon system. It was even used by the Iraqi Special Forces Golden Division. And I hate to say it, but it's also been used by everyone's least favorite forces that rhymes with FISIS. The K2 was often looted from KIA, Iraqi Army Special Forces soldiers, or they got it from Syria, but more on this later. It's also been illegally copied by North Korea and used by their special forces. I guess they couldn't resist dabbling in just a bit of capitalism. So what are the origins of this weapon? Why was it made? Well, at the end of World War II, Korea ended up being divided along the 38th parallel into two different countries, one being North Korea, backed by the Soviet Union, and the other is South Korea, backed by NATO. The Cold War had begun, Communists in the East were ready to square off against the capitalists in the West. Choose your side wisely. In June of 1950, the North Koreans attacked South Korea, beginning the Korean War, which would drag the major superpowers into it. Eventually, the war ended not far from where it started with both North and South in ruins. Sometime after the war, South Korea began to look for a new rifle for their military. At the time, the South Koreans had a large supply of American-made weapons like the M1 Garand and the M2 Carbine. These weapons, however, were starting to fall behind in the times. However, some Korean units had received the M16 after assisting America in the Vietnam War. So in 1974, they got a license from Colt to produce the M16A1, but they found that the license was too much money and as the industry grew throughout South Korea for weapons, the military higher-ups wanted to store enough rifles in case there was another large-scale war. In particular, President Park Chung-hee pushed hard for self-reliance and was one of the major voices behind the creation of a South Korean rifle. He's quoted by saying, If an independent country cannot protect itself with its military, it is not an independent country. Can you really blame them, though? They have the literal neighbors from hell, and they can't even move out of their house into a new one. They're stuck there. Shut up, Chris. No one cares about your stupid YouTube channel. Sorry, that's my neighbor. You shut up, Brad. I'm doing very important work here. How else will people know about how awesome the South Korean military industrial complex is? Just like and subscribe, all right? So Dawoo Precision Industries was established in 1981 to manufacture all of South Korea's weapons. And they also even make grand pianos. I've always thought military firearms were a work of art, like a well-tuned, precise grand piano. That makes me want to say hua, but I won't but I want to. But they stopped making pianos in 1997 to focus on Boom Boom technology instead. In 2006, Daewoo was bought up by another company. Later, that company was renamed s and Motive. Even though the Korean War ended in the 1950s, Korea is still a highly militarized country to this day. So for instance, it still implements a kind of draft or conscription where all able-bodied men at the age of 18 must go and serve the military. I think the reason for this has something to do with the complaints that they have about their neighbors up north. I don't know. Initially, the South Korean army wanted a rifle in the 7.62 caliber styles, but later they changed their mind to chamber it in the 5.56 NATO so they could integrate ammo supplies with their NATO allies. The Korean military was influenced by the AK-47, FAL, but above all else, the M16A1. They tested a couple of prototypes which helped them arrive at the XB-7, which was then officially adopted by the South Korean military and renamed the K2 rifle. They wanted to keep certain features from the M16, like the lower receiver, and the charging handle so they could save time and money in production. The Koreans have a saying that I think fits here. If it doesn't work, make it work. It can even load the M16 magazines, making the change from the M16 to the K2 less of a hassle for the ROK Army. But the actual firing system is different in the K2. It uses a long stroke piston instead of a direct impingement. 
which leads us to the easiest way to tell the difference between the two weapons, which is that the K2 has the ability to have a folding stock. It was inspired by the FAL. Frankly, I'm a little jealous that the South Koreans will never know the pain of climbing in and out of a vehicle with their muzzle getting caught and banging on every wire. So they didn't fully copy the M16 design, doesn't have a recoil spring fitted into the stock. This piece was instead moved above the barrel and they chose a long stroke gas piston system where the AK flavor kind of comes in. It kind of sounds like a Frankenstein gun, but in actuality, the engineers made the parts come together in perfect harmony. The K2 weighed in at about 7.2 pounds without the magazine. Let's be honest, that's the only thing grunts really care about. With an 18.3 inch barrel, it still doesn't disappoint. The K2 can provide effective fire out to 600 meters and a muzzle velocity of 3,000 feet per second slightly less than the M16. South Korean marksmen can be issued with bipods and an X4 PVS 11K optic for their K2s. A limited number of units get the Picatinny rail types, which allow them to mount a variety of sights and night vision optics. It also has the ability to fit bayonets, so they wouldn't offend their European allies. Performance on the battlefield. Its battlefield reputation is a rifle of quality. It has served across Asia, South America, Africa, Pacific, and the Middle East. And in doing the research for this video, we couldn't help but find that there isn't really much negative feedback to the weapon. Sure, it doesn't get the biggest praise, but the fact is it's been serving nearly worldwide for many years and doesn't have a bad rap which speaks volumes to it. It clearly shows it can survive in a variety of extreme conditions. In fact, the only negative thing I found on the rifle was a couple of private owners saying that the weapons felt a little small for them. But you can't forget the reality that the K2 was made for the average height of an Asian male. So quit complaining, you're six feet tall. Life's already easy for you. The K2 has actually already been used on both sides of the conflict. Insurgents that used the K2 against the Iraqi Golden Division said that they liked using it. You might want to instantly discredit anything that the enemy has to say, write it off, but it's actually important to understand how they view their weapons and our weapons as well. Insurgent fighters in Syria, who were part of the group that rhymes with nicest, liked using the K2 in street battles. And as it was a rifle from a faraway land and considered rare in the region, it was used as a kind of status symbol on both sides. The more rare the rifle that you carried, the more the weapon was sought after. The K2 is known as one of those rare rifles. One almost odd positive note for the K2 is that some Iraqi troops preferred the K2 instead of the M4, purely because they thought that the stock was more rugged and long lasting than the M4s. Never thought we'd lose out over a competition of who got the best ass. Overall, the K2 hasn't seen a huge amount of combat compared to rifles of a similar age. Perhaps that's why it's never been able to earn a real reputation yet, but there's still time. Come on, North Korea. No, I'm just playing be cool. Since the K2 has come of age, there's been some developments. After 30 years, the K2C was built and there hasn't been really any changes since. The reason the K2C took so long was owing to the fact that South Korea had favored Cold War doctrine, and they focused more on armored warfare, especially their tanks and artillery. Gotta focus on them big guns. The K2C, the C standing for carbine, had more modern thinking behind it. A shortened 12 inch barrel, right side folding, retractable M4 stock, rail mounts are now standard as is tradition, adjusted gas piston and now painted a tan color, so you know for sure it's modern. It also has the ambidextrous selector switches for dyslexic soldiers, and it now weighs 7.3 pounds. As of right now, there's no official replacement plan for the ROK Army. They did kick around some ideas of a DAR-21, it's like a 5.56 bullpup rifle, but the idea was rejected. The Korean higher-ups even proposed the K-11 dual-barrel airburst weapon as the new replacement. Think of the K-2 or the M-16 with a grenade launcher, now reverse that. That's basically what it is. Would have loved to have seen an army entirely equipped with that thing. There's no way you can trust that amount of lower enlisted with that kind of firepower. The K2 has served the ROK army very well for a long period of time. It served armies around the globe. And it might not have fought in the war that it was made for, but it's still seen combat around the world. It's helped the good guys win in other conflicts. It's been a well-made rifle that a lot of us have missed, but at least we get to appreciate it in this video. Have you guys ever seen this weapon up close or had a chance to shoot it? Let us know in the comments section. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. You're watching Task and Purpose. Check out another video while you're here.